Welcome, welcome. I'm so excited to be here with all of you. This is four weight loss and exercise myths that sabotage your health and happiness. And I'm Cassie Christopher, registered dietitian, postmenopausal weight loss expert. And today I'm talking to Dr. Darian Parker. And you have a lot of expertise in a lot of different areas. So can you introduce yourself to us with what you find to be the most relevant expertise? <laughs> I mean, you know, I like to dip my hand in a lot of different things, but um Dr. Darian Parker, my PhD is in sports education leadership with an emphasis in behavior modification. So that's one area. Um, I also, my master's and bachelor's degree are more on your quote unquote hardcore science uh, study of human movement, exercise physiology related to that. Um, so I may have a good handle on most things related to exercise and wellness um, and behavior change and also the role that exercise plays and does not play in weight loss, which uh, is very relevant to this discussion. Yeah, I'm so excited to get into it. I've had so many people telling me how excited they are for this conversation and, you know, folks continue to trickle in. So I want to welcome yep. all of you. Welcome. Let's just get right into it. We've got four myths for you today. And do you want to take it away and share the first one? Yeah, yeah. So what's interesting, and then how about we read it off and I'm going to yes. talk about it. I would I'd do love that. to. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Myth number one. Are you ready for this? Here we go. Is the most important benefit to movement is weight loss. So what's interesting about this is what we all know, you can line up hundred people and they will tell you moving is really important and being physically active. But what's interesting. And I, I think from my point of view as a 22 year personal trainer is the majority of clients and people I talk to want to work out for weight loss. They view exercise or physical activity as a primary mechanism for weight loss. And they understand that nutrition is a large part of it, but you often get this, I'm going to work out so I can eat what I would like to eat type of thing, which we know that uh, this is not true. This is a huge myth, but as one has been perpetuated for an extremely long time, the truth about it, the very, very honest truth, the research, anecdotal things, the whole thing is that exercise actually contributes very little to weight loss. This, it has a st statistical significance, but it's extremely low, extremely low. And so having exercise be your main reason for weight loss uh, is actually something that is, is not a good idea to enter into exercise for. Now, some people may say, is, well, what the hell am I doing this for then? Well, exercise is a myriad of benefits that have nothing to do with weight loss. Everything from stroke, increase in stroke volume, cardiac output, decrease of cardiac disease, stroke, diabetes. I mean, you name it, the hit list. So greatest hits is what exercise is. It's an album that's the best album you've ever heard for it. It just isn't great for weight loss. And we can dive deeper into that. But Cassie, I'd love for you to add into that as well. Yeah, yeah. I, I know that we're going to go deeper, even as we continue to talk about each myth. But yes, weight loss is not, uh, or rather exercise is not the most effective way to lose weight. But like you're saying, there are specific diseases that I think you might be interested in knowing about um, that, that may make you excited. So uh, exercise is actually more effective when you look at the research to decrease your risk of all cause mortality, which means dying from anything uh, when compared to weight loss even. So take weight loss out of it. Exercise allows you to decrease your risk of dying from anything even more than weight loss. And actually some studies uh, about you know, weight loss have increased people's risk of all-cause mortality, not all of them. And I haven't specifically gone through them all to look and go, why is that? You know, what were they doing that, that did that? Uh, but it's important to recognize that exercise keeps you alive, actually better even 
than losing weight does. And I think that's really important to recognize that there, uh, in, in so many ways, and how I want to frame this conversation, is that exercise is actually better for you than weight loss. But I know oftentimes when you go to the doctor, your doctor is telling you to lose weight, to lose five to 10% of your body weight, often, you know, lose weight, lose weight, lose weight. When a lot of the benefits that you're looking for in terms of, you know, like Dr. Parker said, you know, decreasing your risk of diabetes, decreasing your risk of heart disease. Um, I've got a whole list here. Let's see, increasing mental health, decreased risk of sarcopenia, which is Mm age-related muscle wasting. So we need to be thinking about that. 10 to 20% of women are impacted by sarcopenia, Um, reduced risk of heart disease, stroke, cancer, diabetes, dementia, depression, colds, back pain, osteoporosis, and premature death. Yep. (laughs) Greatest greatest hits. hits. So, you know, yes, uh, exercise maybe isn't effective for weight loss, but exercise is effective for living. And I think that's <laughs> for living. Yeah, more important. More. And important. I think the mechanism too is important with our guest here and people who watch this is to understand why exercise is not necessarily an effective mechanism for weight loss. Yeah. So let's break this down a little bit. A lot of your calorie expenditure, the majority of it, 60 to 80% comes from basal metabolic rate, just keeping you alive, all of your systems, things of that nature. Then you get like 10% for digestion. And then you essentially have about 10 to 30% of energy expenditure, which is from exercise. So you have a hundred percent of energy coming in from nutrition and like 10 to 30% coming in from exercise, regardless of what you do that math does not, that equation doesn't work out very well for that uh, with it. The other thing is, is that there's a tremendous amount of research, um, especially by Ponser and Dr. Daniel Lieberman, who looked at uh, hunter-gatherer tribes and the last ones that are still around, the Hazdas especially. And we have this idea that people who lived in these environments or live in these environments are exercise machines, they're constantly moving, and this is the reason why they have lower body weight. But when we look at it, they actually expend the same amount of energy as the average American and European. Same amount. There is no difference. They actually sit the same amount as the average American and European. The very large difference is the consumption of uh, food is a big difference in that. So with all of this being said is that exercise, incredibly important, but the mechanism behind how exercise works, does it make an efficient vehicle for weight loss? Yep. And I think you've spoken so wonderfully to the second myth, which is exercise is essential to weight loss. I think we've covered that already. It is not essential. But the one thing I want to add to this is Uh, letting everyone, another reason why exercise does not help with weight loss is because when you exercise your, your appetite increases, it's a normal biological response. Your body is wanting to meet these new energy needs. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. Uh, you know, from a survival perspective, maybe not necessarily weight management, but survival certainly. And so, um, exercise increases your appetite and therefore uh, that can make it difficult to lose weight. Something Dr. Darian had said earlier was that um, statistically exercising does help with weight loss. However, it's a very small amount. And when I was going back and looking at the studies, what I saw was over the course of 12 months, diet and moderate exercise together versus just diet the people who exercise lost an additional four pounds over right. the course. I've seen of this a study year. too. Yes. Yeah. So statistically significant, it is more, and it was more for more, you know, for, for a lot of people. Uh, and yet um, most of us would not, you know, get super, super excited about four <laughs> pounds. The, the effort to reward ratio is perhaps not there. And so you know, what is the role of exercise then if it's not for weight loss? We've talked about the other benefits, but one thing I want to note before we move on to our third myth is that exercise is very important for weight maintenance. So once you have lost weight, uh, it, it will help you keep the weight off. And that's because once you lose weight, 
you have to eat less food by usually 60 to 120 calories um, than before. So you had a certain diet, you know, when you were gaining late, uh, when you were, you know, gaining or just staying steady, you lost weight by eating less. And then now you cannot go back to the way things were before. You have to keep your metabolism has decreased. And if you want to maintain your weight loss, you have to keep that amount of food less. Now, I want to quickly add in, you don't have to lose weight in order to get all these amazing health benefits from exercise, okay? So let's keep that in mind. But when it comes to what does the research say about weight loss, weight maintenance, and exercise, we know that exercise can help you keep your metabolism going in addition to eating less food. So if you're starting to go, oh my God, this is why I had such a hard time keeping weight off in the past, it's because it's really hard to keep off. Um, and one more thing for people who are going, okay, how much? I know you all have your notebooks and your pens out. So two, two facts for you. One is the National Weight Control Registry. Um, people who've kept weight off, I believe it's more than a couple of years, more than 30 yeah. pounds. Um, they walk the metabolic equivalent of four miles a day. So it doesn't mean they all walk four miles a day. Some people run, some people go to Orange Theory, some people, whatever, right, swim. Um, but the metabolic output is equivalent to walking four miles a day. And then the American College of Sports Medicine recommends 250 to 300 plus um, minutes of exercise a week for moderate exercise for weight maintenance. So for people who are like, just tell me how much, that's, <laughs> there's your stats. I think the other addition to that too is um, it's daunting for most people if they look at it and they say, I want to use exercise as the primary mechanism for weight loss is that the amount of exercise you would have to do would have to exceed 400 plus minutes a week uh, and beyond, which for most people, they're not willing or not able to do that. And there's lots of barriers to that and it's not sustainable. So, I mean, I guess technically you could make it a primary driver, but it would be insane the amount of time and effort and energy, which would not be sustainable for that. The other thing I think is interesting is research is only as good as the time it's in. And we're always getting new information, but there's some interesting theories out to, to like metabolic compensation, essentially that sometimes if you're exercising too much, it decreases your metabolism and actually creates a barrier to weight loss. So sometimes there's a theory that exercise may actually be keeping you from losing weight. But this is a theory. This is not factual. I'm saying, but there are different theories that are out there and that there may be also a limit to caloric expenditure potentially as well, that a diminishing return in expenditure, which flies in the face of a calories in calories out uh, approach, which is we've heard so much throughout the years, calories in calories out. And generally uh, this much is a little more complex than that. Um, and yeah. I think we try to, it's overly simplistic. And I think it's important that we have a more nuanced conversation about these types of things. Oh, yes. I think that's why you and I gravitated towards each yes. other so quickly is because we're both about the nuance. Like, I cannot give you a yes or no answer. I need to write you a book about it <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so yes. that you understand the ins and outs. Um, I love that idea that you were saying exercise keeping you from weight loss. And I actually see this a lot in my postmenopausal clients, in particular, those who are trying intermittent fasting, mm. because what happens is the research shows even without exercise, intermittent fasting can stress the body. It can increase your stress hormones. And then what people often do is then they exercise on an empty stomach or they exercise without eating either before or after. And then the body is going, ah, <laughs> I don't have enough energy on board and it's sending out stress hormones. The thing about stress hormones, cortisol in particular, is not only does it create belly fat by moving fat from other parts of the body to the belly, but it puts you in an insulin resistant fat storage mode, uh, which can block weight loss. So again, you know, this idea of, of, of exercise leading to weight loss, I know so many people who are waking up early exercising on an empty stomach and maybe seeing more belly fat, um, right. as opposed to what they would expect. So I think that's a great, great point. Um, oh, and for anyone who is like, what does 400 minutes mean? I did the math. It's an hour a day. <laughs> people just aren't going to give that. I mean, there's yeah. so much going on in life and it's just, it's just a huge, Paul, yeah. 
Yep. It's not, if it is, it's sustainable for most people, it's not a very tiny percentage of the population would actually adhere to that. You know? And it takes a lot of privilege to be able to That's spend exactly. There's access, as, access, yeah. quality issues. There's so it's more, it's complex. It's just, yes. it's very yeah. complex. So let's talk about our third myth. And, and this one I'll pass to you. Getting your steps in is enough. Myth number three, what can you tell us about that? Well, I think we've been, you know, this kind of became pervasive, I would say about 10 years ago when, you know, the pedometers and, and beyond that uh, became really popular. I mean, I remember wearing a pedometer in an oh, yeah. exercise physiology lab and all that stuff. Now everybody's phone is a pedometer and a ring is a pedometer and getting 10,000 steps and um, but the reality is it's just one form of activity and a steady state cardiovascular based activity, which addresses the cardiorespiratory system on some level, which is only one system in regards to um, adaptations that occur to the body. It essentially ignores uh, muscular strength, endurance. Uh, there's not a tremendous amount of mobility, stability aspect to that. So I kind of look at this in a way that when people look at, I do this one activity. So like if a runner says, all I, people tend to do this, they get very obsessive about one thing. If somebody loves yoga, they only do yoga or they love runner, they're big and running type of thing or whatever it may be. They tend to don't have a program that is well-rounded that addresses the different systems that have adaptation mechanisms to them with that. So it is a good start. It is a good, it is good to move. Movement is very um, positive and steps are good. It's better than being sedentary, but it's just one small part of the equation for that. So understanding that there, we're trying to do things that are adding external resistance to the body to increase um, muscular definition, increase in muscle size, endurance, the whole thing uh, is really important to um, what you're doing. How many times have you seen, especially with research about the importance of adding external resistance to the body? And especially we've studied many senior citizens in this, and it creates a huge benefit. And, you, and even when people start really late in life, when they're adding an external resistance to their body, they improve by hundreds and hundreds percentage points and their muscular strength, muscular endurance, all to be said that this is just one aspect. You shouldn't say, I got my steps in and I'm good. Okay, that's one thing. And you should be applauded for this one thing. But there are many other aspects to being well, is certainly physically that need to be addressed as well. Yeah, and, and in particular, when you're talking about external resistance, I'm coding that in my brain as strength training. Is that accurate? Sure, yeah, strength training, anything that adds a load upon the body. Initially, that could be your own body, uh, yeah. especially with beginners just working. Your body weight is, is the load that you're, or the external resistance. Then as your body adapts to that, then providing an external resistance, which could be anything from a kettlebell, dumbbell. I mean, it literally could be almost anything. Anything that causes a load can cause, can be a stimulus. Yeah. In, in and our society, we say that's, these different, you know, pieces of equipment, but technically bell. it could yeah. be anything. It could be yeah. literally a log. It could be, a, you know, a heavy door. Seriously, it's whatever is a stimulus that's greater than what you're used to can be an external resistance. Yeah. I know everyone gets excited about this in spring when it's time to garden. <laughs> they can get yeah, yeah. their, their movement in that way. Um, and, and just for those out there connecting the dots, you know, the, M, the, the positive benefit of this strength training, whether it be actually in the gym, the way we think of it, or, you know, more functional out in life is it's going to increase your bone density. Um, it's going to, which is then going to decrease your risk of say breaking a hip or some of these other things that can then land you in the hospital, you know, so it, increasing your ability to remain mobile, remain independent in particular as you age. And then the other thing that I think you mentioned in there was stability. So balance type exercises being very important as well um, as women age, because I know from my clients that uh, independent aging and maintaining you know, independence and mobility for the rest of your life is very yes. important. And so working that in now um, is important. And I believe the recommendations and correct me on this, uh, if I'm wrong, are to strengthen each major muscle group uh, at least two times a day. Is that correct? 
Well, you can, I mean, you could do weight training or resistance training once a week and have tremendous benefit okay. uh, from it. Um, it doesn't take much. Now, the difference is also is that usually what happens is with any population, this is our human nature. We get comfortable. Yeah. So you may start and you go, man, this was difficult and you get better. But if it becomes easy, which it does, once your body adapts, you tend to just keep doing the same thing because it's easy. This is kind of this whole thing. Uh, Alex Hutchinson writes a great, great um, um, blog. It's on, uh, I think it's on Outside Magazine and it's called Sweat Science. And he has this tremendous article and references about how much pain should I be in when I work out, right? There's this, there's this exercise physiologist in me that says, hey, you know, the, being uncomfortable is part of the growth related to it. Yeah. Right. But then it's like, if it's too uncomfortable, then people, they have attrition, right? Like they don't yep. want to do it. Yep. But the reality of it is that if you're going to improve, there has to be overload. There has to be a, a stimulus that is greater than what the body's used to in order to keep moving forward. Without that, continued use is maintenance. There's nothing wrong with that if that's what you want to do. But to continue to move forward to reach maybe your the ceiling, which is very difficult to do, there's going to have to be gradual stimulus and overload. I always tell the people, the person running, you think if let's say a miler, the mile does not get easier when they run it at four minutes than it's at eight or 10 minutes. It's actually incredibly harder at four minutes. So I always tell us my clients getting in better condition doesn't mean that it's going to be easier or more fun. It actually means it's going to just get harder over time Yeah. for that. Again, that may not be what you want. That's, that's totally fine. And you, you may be happy with being at a certain place. And I, that is wonderful. The fact that you're doing those things uh, is, is really important for that. But strength training, we know the benefits are tremendously excessive. They're the also greatest hits. And what I'm really happy is that this has crossed all genders as well with this, because in the past, this was something that was considered very taboo uh, for a female population. And now you're seeing a more a strong, strong women, strong people who are accepting that this is an, a critical part. We talked about sarcopenia, right? That is a huge aspect of aging, something that I think the general population doesn't understand this. I agree. And especially as we age is that we, we, we are, this is a biological mechanism that is ticking down. It's, it's a sands of time clock here, but it is totally possible to be in your fifties and have the biological functional capacity of somebody in their early twenties. It's just going to require a lot of effort for that. And exercise, we know research wise becomes more valuable. The older you get, it actually increases its effectiveness as you age. That alone is part of the greatest hits, maybe the greatest thing. I love that. I love that. And I want to go back to this idea that exercise should be hard because part of my work that I'm doing with women around eating is helping people learn to feel their feelings and sit with their mm. suffering rather than using food to get away from it. And mm. the connection here is that we don't like to suffer. We like to be comfortable. And, you know, it's, it's because we're human. It's not because we're lazy. It's because that's, you know, part of being human. And also yeah. a lot of us have trauma histories that make it scary to enter into suffering that might not feel safe. And so the really interesting thing about exercise and, you know, I didn't come up with this. This is from Dopamine Nation, which is a book uh, written by a Stanford psychologist about addictions. And I'll say, I'll just do a quick asterisk. I mentioned the book. I don't agree with her use of food as an addiction, the way she talks about it. So right. that's a, that's neither here nor there, <laughs> but I don't, you know, I, I don't Disclaimer. want people going Cassie. <laughs> yeah. Cassie is saying this is everything. And this is, is, you know, she agrees with, um, but the piece that I do agree with is 
exercise and she talks about it movement is painful and it sets you up to be able to hold space for pain to hold space for suffering and it increases your capacity to do that both physically and emotionally so it's training you in many different ways to um to willingly do something uncomfortable and to be able to yeah hold space for that discomfort and sit with it. And I know many of us, especially those in my community are working at increasing their capacity to sit with discomfort. Exercise is a great way to do that because it is hard. And sometimes it does suck. Let's just say it. Let's That's just true. Say it. And this is, this is something I've been, I've had a lot of conversation with because, you know, I have different colleagues who have obviously everybody's different points of view and there's a large contingent out there that, you know, Hey, do something you really love to do. Great. Um, that's awesome. If you enjoy roller skating, skateboarding, surfing, all that, that's amazing. All these things are amazing things to do. But when you're talking about improvement, right? Think about anything you've improved doing. It's hard in the beginning and you're not used to doing. Um, there's going to be some level, uh, level of being uncomfortable. And funny to say, and the research that has been done recently about workouts and what is difficult and what is not, People who work out harder say that they enjoy their workouts more than the people who work out low intensity usually say they don't enjoy working out for that. Think about that. The people working out really hard enjoy it more than the people who are working out at a lower, moderate intensity. They generally don't like it for that. It's just, it's an interesting study, an interesting survey of that. But I love the holding space for discomfort in a sense, because that's what I love about exercise. It's, it's one of the few times in the week, honestly, for me, where I get to be really uncomfortable. I mean, there's a lot of things that are Uberized in our life that has made our lives much easier. And if it's life is always easier in terms of I'm hungry, bring that to me. I need this, bring this to me. When are you ever being tested? When are you ever being uncomfortable in terms of pushing your body? So it's, it's a great it's a it's an interesting way to look look at it. I, I see both sides, but I also understand that it's really important that improvement requires a stimulus greater than what you're used to, and often that is uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I admire that you enjoy being uncomfortable. I cannot say that I'm there yet. Although when I am in that moment where my calves are burning on my little couch to 5k, which I just do on repeat, because that seems to work for my body. Yeah. Uh, I, and I'm going, okay, I'm getting stronger. I can't say that I'm, I'm where you are yet. I wouldn't I'm say I would enjoy uh, working really. <laughs> I mean, I've been doing it. I think I'm on like, you can get used to almost anything. I mean, yeah. I've been working out hard yeah. since I was like 15, like really hard. And I continue to do that. But I think it's the, it's the information. It's what I know that keeps me going too. It's not, I don't, just because I'm in the business for a long time, doesn't mean that I have this great love affair with exercise. I think that's important. I suffer like anyone else. Sometimes I don't want to do it. And sometimes I feel like, oh, I got other things to do, but I know, I know what it means. I understand the stakes. This is the greatest hits of health. And I need to be a part of that in order to have the best quality life that I could have for myself and my family. So even when I don't want to do it, I remember that this is going to extend the quality of my life. And and this is another point I think is important is uh, I don't know everyone's age is on here, but I know some people, you know, as we enter into I'm 44 and you start entering into the uh, morbidity window where you just this is the difference between uh, lifespan and health span. Right. You may want to live to 80, 90. But how much of that is actually a healthful, physically functional life? You may spend 30 years in very poor condition. What's the point of that? Like there is an option out there that allows you to have an extended life, a long life that is functional. And this is what I do with a lot of people. I was like, listen, we need to work on you not being afraid of the ground. We start leaving the ground as we get older and then we fear it. But we need to have more functional mobility, stability, so that we can get up and get down, which becomes, which sounds dumb when you're like 22. You're like, I can get up, no problem. But sounds um, sounds very terrifying when you get much older and you haven't been on the ground in a while. Yeah, 
I, I hear that all the time that, that my clients want to be able to not be afraid of getting on the ground and playing with their grandkids. And that's, that's a big one. So yeah. let's get to the fourth myth and then we will have time for Q and A. So anybody listening live, go ahead, get into chat, change the two to say everyone and share your questions. Cause I want to make sure that we have time to answer them before we wrap up today. So the fourth myth today is all you need is more discipline. All you need is more self-control. All you need is more willpower. Okay, I'm going to tackle this one because those of you in my audience know that I'm always telling you that willpower, self-control, and self-discipline have very little to do with your actual habit change when it comes to food. And actually, when you're thinking that's the problem, you always are the problem. You always end up beating yourself up and you can't actually problem solve to find real solutions to what's going on. So let's talk about this. All you need is more discipline. This isn't true. One of the reasons this isn't true is research shows that people who suffer from internalized weight stigma also have lower levels of motivation to exercise. I've got a couple points for you. This is one of them. Here's what I mean by this. Weight stigma, weight bias. This is the belief that people in larger bodies are essentially less worthy of love and connection with other people. It's the belief, weight stigma, that people in larger bodies are lazy, that they have done something to get themselves to that place. And internalized weight stigma means that you believe that about yourself. Okay, that you have internalized the shame that our culture places on people living in larger bodies. And that that is the words that you speak over yourself when you look in the mirror. Oh, I think I might get emotional. Um, and it's very common. And many people suffer with this. You come by it honestly, because this is what our culture says about people living in larger bodies. And it's not true for so many reasons. And feel free to shoot me an email and I will, I will write you an essay about it um, or you know, reach out to me. We can have a conversation because now is not the time. Um, but what we need to realize is if, as I described that, you're going, oh my God, that's me. I say these things to myself. I believe this about myself. That it is something that's correlated with lower levels of motivation to exercise. And that makes so much sense because you're seeing your body as, you know, not as this thing that is doing its best for you, but rather this, this thing that is working against you um, and making you look bad. Right. And so, and so your connection to your body ends up then decreasing your motivation to exercise. One more thing about motivation. And I was, uh, I was telling you about this before we got started, but uh, there was a study done uh, where they asked people to write out their thoughts and beliefs about exercise. And then based on what people wrote, they categorized people into two categories. One category was what they called body shapers. And these are people who exercise in order to get smaller, lose weight, they might have talked about calories. They might have talked about, you know, building up muscles, things like this. They're trying to shape their bodies. And then there were the non-body shapers, the people who exercise for reasons related to feeling good, you know, maybe sarcopenia, maybe that was in there. I don't know. Um, and what they found is that the body shapers exercised 40% less than the non-body shapers, that people whose connection to weight loss was, or connection to exercise rather, was, you know, because of weight loss, uh, they didn't exercise as much. And you can see now because of this conversation, you know, one reason why that might be is that exercise isn't effective for weight loss in that way that I think people are expecting it to be. So that's part of it. But I think the other part of it goes to, you know, what it means about your relationship with your body and how you're caring for it versus how you're punishing it because it has betrayed you in some way. And so, you know, I just want to say if you need help uh, with changing your relationship to your body, that's completely possible. You're welcome to reach out to me. This is something I help people do all the time because it's, it's a very effective way to then change your relationship with exercise and your relationship with food because you're thinking about caring for yourself differently. What do you think about this? Yeah, most definitely. Um, what's interesting, I have 
I mean, this is not an area I've had a lot of exposure to research related to it, but I can talk about, you know, my 22 years working with people and uh, the overwhelming majority of my clients have been with me most of that time do not exercise for weight loss. They, they understand that this is not the reason that they're here. So uh, understanding what is the relationship to your body also has just a lot of psychosocial aspects to it. And it's under in the investment in your own mental social, emotional, and spiritual health is a, is a large part of that as well. This, this goes into the area of behavior change uh, with that um, and how you see yourself, uh, which is an incredibly important and growing aspect of the relationship with exercise that is just not just physical. It is the relationship you have with your body physically, but more than not, the relationship with you have with your body spiritually, socially, emotionally, your relationships that you have in your life, how, how the people in your life make you feel about your body, and those things, who you're around. Th again, this goes into, it's a nuanced conversation. It cannot be just, you know, black or white, cut and dry. This is here, the rubber meets the road. This, it's not like that. So I think it's never enough about willpower this terrible word, by the way, willpower or laziness. I'm not going to lie. I used to think people were very lazy a long time ago. I'd like to be very transparent about how I used to feel have been these things. But when I've gained much more knowledge, especially anthropological knowledge and biological knowledge of our past as humans tells us that we're overcoming or overriding a mechanism that is so biologically strong to conserve, to keep energy, to keep fat, to that we have in our history have conserved because of the, how we have lived for thousands of years. And if you really think about it, how we live now is completely foreign to our bodies. It is literally like we're on another planet because how we've lived for the most of our ancestry has been exactly the opposite of how we live now. And we're struggling with it completely. This we don't, we're not living a lifestyle that is generally what has been the lifestyle of our ancestors for most of our human history, our technological industrial uh, innovation, which is going quicker and quicker and quicker is literally the opposite of what we have been doing. So I don't think it's necessarily that people are lazy or anything like that. I think they're generally overcoming this mechanism that is literally trying to pull them backwards all the time. So I feel for that uh, yeah. with people because you're, you're fighting something you probably don't know what it is initially either. And it's yeah. deep. It's not just a surface thing. And it's this way with eating as well. And yes. you know, my community knows I'm always talking about that strong drive to eat, those cravings. Yes. That's coming from your biology. It's not that you are just some you know, food maniac. So right. I love that. And may we have compassion, you know, for everything you said, may we have compassion for ourselves. May we have compassion for other people and recognizing that, you know, uh, that being healthy and, and changing behavior, it is difficult. It is difficult. And I really like what Dr. Nitschke said. I always tell my clients and students, it's not about the body. It's about your relationship with your body, which I think is so true when we're thinking about how can we get ourselves to exercise more. All right, we've got just a few moments left. So I would love for everyone to hit the chat box and share with us either a question you have for Q&A or a takeaway. I always love to hear takeaways. So, you know, what is that big idea that has stuck out to you that you know you're going to be thinking about for the rest of the week? So a question you have or a takeaway. And while you're doing that, I just want to say, I think this conversation begs the question of, do you need to lose weight? And if so, how do you go about doing it? Um, I think you can know by now that you can be healthy without losing weight and you may still want to lose weight and that's okay too. Uh, and, you know, if you want to go about doing it, you know, start with some movement get moving because we know that's good for your body. It's not necessarily going to be the weight loss side of things. And if you need help to get 
food and get eating into a place where you go from maybe chaotic, maybe back and forth, all or nothing, either eating perfectly or, you know, back to old habits. And you want to go calm, consistent, healthy. I want you all to know that you're welcome to download my free audio guide. It's a cravings buster. You can listen to it for 10 minutes at cassiechristopher.net. And that audio guide is you're going to use it in the moment when you have the craving and you need, uh, you know, something besides eating. It's going to give you the step-by-step to walk you through a 10 minute exercise for you to do in the moment when you have the craving so that you don't end up actually following through on that biological impulse to go eat something. Dr. Parker, if people want to work with you while they're typing in their questions, how can they get a hold of you? Yeah, pretty simply, just darianparker at gmail.com. Um, email is my main mode of uh, communication uh, with people and uh, drdarianparker.com, my website. Uh, talks all about um, my philosophy towards working with people, which is a very heart-centered, loving, caring, functional, mobility-based system, and and being with you. It's about companionship. Um, it's really important. I think we need each other. All of us need each other. It's so critically important. And while it's a discussion about exercise and weight loss it's generally a larger discussion about how much we need to support each other in our journeys. Everybody has a different journey, but a lot of people have a very similar journey. And weight loss, I could tell you, is something that is a huge desire and journey for a lot of people that I've talked to throughout the years. And one of the things I always do is like, I want to understand why this is such a large desire. And what is the outcome of this weight loss? Do you think it will make you happy? And what does happiness mean to you, if that's the case? So really like making, I'm all about making people explain themselves. And when people explain themselves, they generally come to some version of a truth that either they knew or didn't, often they don't know for that. And I think that's the point of this is understanding information. There's a lot of information out there. You can look it up, but synthesizing in a way that makes a lot of sense. But I think a lot of the current research is pretty clear. Exercise is a very inefficient way for, to lose weight, but it's a great way to maintain weight. And it is a, the greatest hits of, of so many other benefits uh, for that. Let's say we have Aaron, yes, helping people dig down deep to uncover their why. Yeah, exactly. Most people don't look at why they do things. They just do things. You know, I mean, it's something my daughter does. Why'd you do that? I don't know. I'm like, okay, let's talk about why you did that. We need to know why, what is the origin of this? You know, so adults too, uh, for that. Um, but I often find that people, once they, as they age and, um, they're going through these many lifetimes that they're living as adults and that it really comes down to feeling better about yourself, being happy and being able to do the things you want to do. Uh, in life. The hardest thing is when I see people not having to shrink their world because they no longer have the mobility, the functionality in order to do the things they love. They've had to shrink their world. That's something we need to change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. I don't see any questions Mm -hmm. now. If anyone has questions later, Um, I know Dr. Parker, you just gave your uh, email address. You can hit reply to any one of the emails from me. Denise's takeaway here was learning all about exercise. Yeah. Right. Like we talked a lot about exercise so much and internalized weight stigma. I'm glad that was helpful for you, Denise. Thanks for coming. Thanks Denise. We'll let you all go. Thanks so much for spending this time with us. And the recording will be made available. Uh, It takes me a couple days, so you'll, you'll get it soon. Thank you all for coming.